All right, so welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Uh, my guest today is Dan Curran. Dan's a mechanical Howdy. engineer. Good to have you, Dan. And uh, he's Good got you. a background. Excellent. Good to have you here. <laughs> mechanical design and engineering, uh, some industrial automation stuff, and then some product stuff as well. Um, so if you want to tell me, uh, we before the pod, we were talking a little bit about some of the industrial automation processes, and then we we're going to kind of get into benchmarking some of the differences and, and kind of what's interesting about those approaches. So, yeah. Yeah. So where should we begin? Uh, so I, I think we just jump right into the process stuff. Um, and then, I mean, you can get in the backstory of how we know each other if we feel like it later on, but I don't know that's super interesting yeah. to listeners as much right. as like so, the realities of the process and what it's like to do on the job, you know? Absolutely. Uh, so I spent about the last four years in uh, industrial automation. And uh, we were designing custom automated manufacturing equipment for a variety of customers. And uh, I was learning a lot. I was a sponge. Um, it was, yeah, it was great. So, <laughs> 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 squishy. Um, squishy and absorbent. <laughs> trying, to, trying to learn as much as I can from um, most of the engineers that I was working with who were no to, towards the tail end of their careers. Nice. Um, so they've been doing this for for thirty something years. The Those older guys are amazing. Oh my god! Yeah. You any any problem you have, they have a solution for. And they've seen it yeah. fifty times or more. Yeah, there is there is a right way to do things most of the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had, I had a huge amount of respect for for everybody that I I worked with and worked for. Um, it was a great experience, and the company. In addition to you know engineering specifics, the company itself was run really, really efficiently. Um, so they had spent thirty years dialing in their processes uh, as a small you know company of eighty to one hundred people. Um, so just kind of picked up everything I could from that. That's awesome. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that, uh, but just to to give some foreshadowing here, um, I then Absolutely. took that into product design. Um, so I'm, I'm currently in a product design role for a, a more mass produced product, uh, targeting something like 10 to 20,000 pieces a year. Um, you're working directly for the company that makes the product, right? So you're like an in-house engineer and you're refining like the thing right. that you're selling as a company. Yeah, completely different. Uh, everything cool. I know or thought I know needs to kind of do a 180 and the perspective <laughs> shift. Difficult, but fascinating. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to share with you what I've seen. Sounds good. Uh, what kind of whiskey did you end up grabbing by the way, before we jump in? We grabbed a Balvenie. Nice. Balvenie, Pete Week, 14 year. I've got a Basil Hayden, not, not as fancy, but a pretty good bourbon from the South. I, uh, I quite enjoy it. Excellent. So, uh, cheers. Good to have you on the pod. Cheers. Industrial automation has been something that's held my interest for a very long time. You know, my dad actually did probably 10 years worth of industrial automation while I was in high school. Um, and I would go into work with him on occasion and see what he was working on. This is how I started in CAD too. Um, CAD being you know, computer aided design, right? Just for the lay people out there. Yes, sir. Cool. <laughs> I was looking over his shoulder as he was working in 2D AutoCAD. Uh, nice with like crazy layers man we have it so easy with solidworks and 3d modeling <laughs> I, I can't imagine doing things 30 years ago uh so with, this would have been the, like the 90s um like early 90s when, when they were doing 2d autocad he was a stalwart he uh kept going into like 2005 2008 maybe oh crap. like he was he was using AutoCAD 2000 probably 10 years after it released before finally switching to SolidWorks. So he was just kind of set in his ways and he was like, I don't see a reason to change because this one's yeah. doing it for me. That yeah, a little bit. So, I mean, I started there too. I started in 2D CAD and, you know, I have to say it gives you a good perspective on did you, 2D drawing. Did you get in your dad's work computer or like where did you get started with that? Uh, he had a copy of AutoCAD 2000 on our home computer. Nice. So we, he taught me how to use it. That's awesome. I kind of got into computers similarly. So I remember my dad, and this wasn't CAD, but my dad um, got this Macintosh in like the early 90s. And I remember I was, I was like, you know, five, eight years old, something like that. 
and um, he had this friend, uh, Larry Wexler. Uh, Larry worked in the same field. They're both doctors. And so basically, uh, Larry was like the early adopter guy. He like knew all the latest tech. Like when a new computer would come out, Larry would buy it and then like brag about it. And then my dad would have to have it and they'd compete. And so Larry yeah. got this Mac and I can't remember what it was. It was like a power PC. It was like, like the old beige box that you, you saw from back in the day. Mm-hmm. And then um, I remember him showing my dad how to hook it up and like, I just was a sponge, right? I was like you. I was trying to figure out every bit I could about how yeah. it worked, and I memorized all of it. And then I, you know, I got his old computer and I started playing with that. And then I got a Windows computer. I started playing with that, and you know, I sort of started messing with computers that way. It's a lot easier to be a sponge as a kid than it is to be a sponge in your twenties. <laughs> Let me tell well, you. <laughs> I think the difference is when you're a kid, you're not expected to produce results. Whereas, like, as an adult, right, like, I mean, I I know at least when we hire people, we want someone that, like, has done it before a bunch of times. And when I say it, I mean the thing that we're hiring for. So, like, learning on the job is almost, it happens, but it's not, it's not the primary thing that you're there for. Like, you're there to get the job done. And, like, secondarily, you might learn something while you're doing it. And I think if you stick around long enough, you have a good opportunity to learn. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. As you said, you know, it's, you got to thrust right into the shark pit day yeah. one most places well exactly and like i know when like a customer starts to trust me and my team like i mean we sort of have more opportunity to go a little bit outside of our comfort zone and try new things and that's where you really learn where like yeah. when you're just starting the relationship i mean you have to just prove yourself and do things that you're really good at and you've got down pat and so yep. I, I don't know if that's been your experience as well it sounds like it has yeah it has been and it's been as like i like i alluded to it's, it's been especially difficult uh at this latest transition point going from machine design into product design because the two worlds kind of take completely different approaches to things. So we were going to talk about that and then I, I totally went yeah. off the rails with this Macintosh story. Let's, let's go into that a little bit. Sure. Um, so with, with machine design, you really just need to deliver a working machine, ideally on time, ideally under budget, and if you do that, you, as the engineer designing the machine, will make the company you are working for money. Presumably, yep. someone has paid your company to produce a machine. And when you deliver it, they complete the transaction. Yeah, that makes sense. And you really only have one opportunity to, to make real money uh, delivering custom automated equipment or custom equipment in general. Yeah. And so what you know most companies end up doing is they bake into their pricing models uh spending money to eliminate risk and to save time that makes sense it it does it makes it makes a lot of sense if you are a, a limited team and you are trying to deliver quickly the more quickly you move off of one project and onto the next one the more quickly you can make that next round of money for your company. And you've got fixed overhead. You have to pay the rent. You have to keep the lights on. You have to pay salaries. And so yep. the quicker you can turn those projects around, the more you're going to earn, the less likely you are to go out of business because you're not earning enough money to pay your fixed overhead. Absolutely. So it becomes very attractive to spend money to eliminate risk. So you buy the higher quality thing as opposed to the lower quality thing so that you can... So like a PLC be... versus an Arduino, right? Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you'd never see an Arduino in industrial <laughs> equipment. But on the flip side, in, in product development land, Arduinos are commonplace. All the time, yeah. No, we, we see yeah. them a lot as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's like I said, it's, it's two kind of completely different worlds. The one thing I um, noticed, oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, go ahead. When, when I worked in advertising, so I, I worked for a company that did like large uh, publicity stunts for big brands for a little bit. And there were a lot of Arduinos there, I noticed. And so that was one mm. where you would expect it to be sort of um, like maybe some hybrid of, of both. And, and it kind of was. There were certain components there that were sort of automation grade. Like I remember we used like a Viacom vision system one time. Um, for something because I mean it just would work and you didn't have to be mm-hmm. you know insane with tuning it in uh, but there were a lot of Arduinos as well and stuff like that so it was like somewhere in the middle and I feel like like at least you know it was good to have both those kind of approaches and, and be sort of conversant. right I, I you know most college students graduate 
at least in in engineering or mechatronics, right? Yeah. They'll graduate having used an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi or oh, some other sure. kind of hobby level controller system. And having that experience is really helpful, but having the experience of like the highest order of you know success, the 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 gold standard, the PLC, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's also really really important because once you see the full spectrum you know exactly what you need to do the job, right? It's all about using the right tool for the job. Yeah, and they're so different. I mean, like a PLC, I feel like, like first of all, the cost is way higher. So like like an Allen Bradley PLC is like $5,000 the last time I checked around there. Allen Bradley is about the most expensive though. Okay, So you can point. do, say if you go to Automation Direct, you can buy a PLC for 180 bucks. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, there's, uh, right, there's ways to do it for like not dramatically more than we're in Arduino, Arduino is like, what, what does a mega cost? The, I feel like I megas what, are about 40 something. Yeah. I think. And then there's Raspberry the knockoff ones for like 22 that like, like maker son or like Elegoo or yep. whatever the, the name of the brand. I'm sure it's I'm getting Elegoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's a real one. That's all over Amazon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Raspberry Pis, I think, are 55 last time I checked. Yeah. But, and that's you know, the Raspberry Pi 4. And it seems better on paper than the PLC. Because it's got like multi cores and, and all these features, and it's got like two display outputs. Depends on what you're trying to do with it. Well, right? and that's that's the thing that I don't think people realize when they're starting out, right? Because on paper, again, you're like it's got all these features. It has, you know, um, processing power, processing power, operating, exactly. system, operating system, USB, like exactly, you can use it kind all of this, like a computer, all this stuff, right? And you're like, why would you ever pay? Four times as much for something that doesn't even do any of that stuff. Doesn't doesn't have a display right. port. Doesn't have. You can write whatever system. programming language you want. Yeah, you know? exactly. You have to program it with like pictures. You know, if it's a PLC, basically. I mean, it's it's like yeah. a, like a flow diagram. You you have to do a lot of these ladder logic. Yeah, and I've PLCs worked with the, operate on ladder logic. Yep. <laughs> it's it's kind of graphical, like it, it. I guess it is more or less a graphical programming language. I mean, there's which, blocks you can throw in with the ones I've worked with. Right. So, right. Yeah. It's all about putting, uh, I forget what the contacts, I think this is what they're called, contacts on rungs. But the thing with a PLC is that you can do a ton in parallel. Yeah. Right. That's the kind of the key difference. Whereas, so when you mean you're like it's not going to get bogged down, is what you're trying to say. Kind of. Okay. If you're writing a program with Raspberry Pi, first off, you're limited in terms of your inputs and outputs. Okay. Um, you're, you're quite limited. And that's and just by the number make... of like GPIO ports, like the, okay, so the yep. amount of things you can read on one side, the amount of things you can control on the other side. I don't yeah. know which side Inputs my hands are and on, outputs. But, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, they make expansion cards for, for both Arduino and for Raspberry Pi. Uh, I think Raspberry Pi is better suited for expansion than Arduino is. Interesting. Um, but they make boards that communicate via I squared C. And Which is meant really to be open an up inter board communication library. Yeah. So you've exactly. been going over I mean, a header. I mean, that's that's appropriate use, but anything yep. beyond that, if you go over a cable, that's kind of an inappropriate use of I squared C. I've seen it done. I have too many <laughs> times. Um, but I, yep. I, I always kinda get a little right. bit I mean, nervous when the I the parts see it in done. your car don't talk to each other via I squared C, they They're talk using... to each other probably via CAN. Yep. Yeah. Not exactly. a guarantee, but you know. Probably. There's different... an automotive standard. It was designed for that. And it's it's about, what is it, like 10 times the speed of like the serial bus on the Arduino? I couldn't Last tell time you. we benchmarked. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, and then, like I said, PLC, you can do a ton in parallel. So if you are trying to, say, collect inputs from 30 different sensors, collate them into some data output, and then turn a bunch of stuff on and off in response to those inputs, 100% of the time, you're going to want to use a PLC. I mean, really, <laughs> like it, it's just that's what it's meant to do. So what makes a it Raspberry better, Pi, that, I guess, like just, just to kind of get at the core of that? Because I've seen them used, and I've never seen one fail in, in like a secured application like that. But I mean, that's kind of it. They, yeah. they very, very rarely And I've fail. seen a lot of Arduinos fail. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Those applications, same with the Raspberries, but a lot of it comes down to like contact hardening from a mechanical perspective, like the fact that you're not like strain relieved um, 
and, and you know, kind of stuck in there. So like if you get like a vibration, your contact can shake out of that little terminal block and, and that sort of breaks yeah. your, your machine. No, um, mechanical robustness is super, super important. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually just did a, a project with a Raspberry Pi, except I bought a DIN rail mount kit and a bunch of terminal blocks and I did it like a yeah. PLC electrical cabinet. Just the brains were a Raspberry Pi. Nice. Um, because I wanted the mechanical robustness. I want this thing to sit and run for months and not have to worry about it jiggling itself loose. Yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, like at oh, least yeah. back in school, you'd see projects like that where they were using an Arduino and, you know, there'd be an actuator that would turn a little too far and it would pull a wire out and then that would be the end of that. I mean, Arduino, the entire like electrical interface to Arduino are these just featureless Molex pins that you're supposed to just slip something over and have it stay put forever, you know, forever. Like <laughs> most people's solution to that is to hot glue it. Yep. Yeah. I've I mean, seen that a lot. Come on, like use a connector with a latch or something or screw terminals. Yeah. Like, but I mean, they just, make like different... screw terminal boards for the, for the Arduino and I'm just kind of playing yeah. devil's advocate here. Right. Oh so yeah. I'll, no, I'll... they do. People have tried to solve these problems with, you know, all kinds of, solutions but at the core raspberry pis and arduinos are not intended to be used in demanding industrial so it's application. more than just the mechanical robustness it's also like the the circuitry and and like the there's the redundancy in the code base i wonder like, yeah there's probably something like that yeah um i mean i touched on this briefly but plcs are programmable logic controllers and they they execute Essentially, they take they have, they have a cycle time, and every cycle, they look at all of the inputs. Oh, hello. They evaluate all of the rungs of the ladder logic. Yep. And they calculate all the outputs, and then they make it happen. And then it repeats itself. Nice. So everything so happens in parallel. parallel. Okay, okay, right. that makes sense. That's, thank you for the explanation. Yeah, that's kind of the, the key architectural difference. So PLCs do everything in parallel. Yeah. And Arduino so totally no... is serial. It's a pipeline based oh, yeah. Yeah, architecture. Yep. Like you get under what those, it's an Atmel chip, right? Uh, yeah. So. Yep. And I couldn't, I'm not like computer science-y enough to tell you whether you can do parallel threading and stuff on a Raspberry Pi. I think you can. Probably but with the modern like, chips. Um, but it's, yeah. it's like an eight core, right? That they're using now or something like that, I would think. Yeah. And so I don't know. I mean, yep. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like that's that's not its intent, right? Well, and you're also running like operating system threads and like all sorts of extra background processes because it's running a Linux build. And so yeah. that's nothing to do with your application. It's it's higher level, it's and no one with all this stuff. No one has ever seen an operating system crash or fail. <laughs> Never ever had a blue screen or uh, the spinning wheel of death on the Mac or just a Linux error that nobody knows what it is and they're never going to help you read the man pages, you yeah. stupid person. Cut the bloat. <laughs> Cut the bloat. Use a PLC if you want to do like robust industrial controls. <laughs> Makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. I, I mean, that's that's all we used for, for machines, right? Every industrial machine that I've ever worked on has used a PLC at its core. Um, some of them have added a computer. So you can have a computer talk to the PLC system, maybe via Ethernet, maybe, you know, whatever you choose, uh, so that it can do different kinds of calculations, data visualization, uh, maybe running proprietary software, who knows, um, right? There, there's lots of applications where that is helpful. Yeah. But to control the equipment and to make sure that it runs millions of cycles without screwing up, at all you know really plc is the way to go yeah that's awesome I, I we use them when i worked in the mining industry pretty extensively i mean because that equipment you know if it malfunctions uh, is if you don't kill anybody it's it's tens of millions of dollars of property damage just for one you know crash or, or failure and so and we would sell yep. these 20 I mean, we haven't even we haven't even talked about like safety rated equipment, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a thing all on its own. There's no such thing as a safety rated Arduino. <laughs> no, was, come on, you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't fly a spaceship with an Arduino. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But again, I mean, not to like endlessly crap on Arduino, but like it's it's all about using the right tool for the job. That makes sense. If I want to take one pump and I want to turn it off and turn it on, and turn it off and turn it on, maybe an Arduino is good enough, like minimum necessary thing to get that running. Yeah. Right. But even then, it sounds like your mean time to failure is still going to be lower. Um, like you might get away with it, but I mean, if you want a long well, if you are trying year, to use if you're trying to use the time function on an Arduino, I think it's a 32 bit number, like a float maybe that calculates time. And I believe it resets itself in like 42 days or something. That is the longest you can run an Arduino uninterrupted before the clock, the time function that's built into Arduino resets and goes from its highest value to zero. Just because it just doesn't have any more room for numbers in the register. The variable fills up. Yep. So if you want to run for longer than that, you need to account for that and essentially build a new data type to add digits to the Yeah, which means you've got to spend 42 days in testing to validate that, which means you're paying your engineers (laughs) to sit around an Arduino for 40 days at an engineering salary, which means maybe you should have bought the PLC and it would be a wiser financial decision. I like your argument there. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Some people are unswayed by these these types of arguments, but, you know, Uh, it makes sense to me. I've worked with those people as well. And you know, yeah. it's not always that you don't want a PLC. So like PLC is like you mentioned, like the, the, the point of entry, the price of entry, I should say, is like buck seventy if you buy an automation direct one, $170 uh, US. And so I guess, you know, if you're building a consumer product, if you're building like a like a Roomba or, or a lawnmower or a microwave, I mean, you don't want your bill of material to have a $170 line item in it because nobody will be able to afford that thing. And if it fails, right, it's not thing. catastrophic. I mean, you know, like worst case, you know, I don't know, somebody has to buy another microwave for thirty bucks, you know, and, and or you have to honor. Or they warranty. send it back to you under warranty, and you replace it for half that. Right? Yep. Your bomb cost <laughs> is like, right? So, and and that's kind of the thing that's most differentiating between the two types of development. In industrial automation, like I said, you have one shot to make money. So it's a very good idea and very good business practice to spend more to eliminate risk and get it right quickly, get it right the first time. Yeah. Jump to an answer that's good enough, make it work, and deliver it. Yeah, that makes sense. In product development, your margins are very, very small, and you're going to worry about thousands and thousands of copies of, of what you're designing. Yeah. So even if it costs you a lot to make the first one and the second one and the third one, you're going to make that back on sales of the 10,000th one. Sure. I mean, the way you look at it, right, is if you're going to sell 10,000 copies of something, something that you do that saves you a dollar on every copy of it. $10,000. It's $10,000, right? Yeah. And if in order to make that you have to spend eight thousand dollars in tooling to make that dollar savings worth it that's that's a threshold where it's worth it but if you have to spend twelve thousand dollars to save a dollar and you're only expecting to sell ten thousand of them not worth it not worth it yeah that right? makes sense. so every every dollar is is scrutinized in a way that is not in in machine design yeah that makes sense Interesting. But if if machines you're designing are being used to build products, there's got to be some level at which, you know, you you would go over budget if you bought more expensive stuff, I would think. Yeah. I mean, it's it it all depends on what you bake into it. Yeah, that's fair. And how many units you you expect to sell? Like, yeah. Okay. Yep. So the bill of materials cost on a on a consumer product is is everything i mean that that really is the driver of the price point of the product its competitiveness within the market your profit levels as a company that number yeah and it's not just engineering i mean you have to pay marketing people you have to keep the lights on you've got to pay sales people you've got to pay you know your ceo you've got to pay back your investors for the money they put in you know in the form of dividends all of the profit all the profit goes towards all those things Yep. Um, and so uh, if you can get to the finish line and launch a successful product 
having spent as little as possible in the development cycle, yep. you won. You win. It makes sense. So there's this there's this mindset that everything you gotta do has to be done as cheaply as possible. Um so that you can maximize those those profits when you actually finally go to launch. That makes a lot of sense. So that's that's where like the difference in philosophy in terms of design comes from. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So there's, you know, and, and I obviously can't speak to every product development company. Um, this really is my, my second one, uh, if you count my first job. But sure. it, you know, it, it's an approach that Well, I mean, the mining really vehicles comes... I built were technically products and they used PLCs, right? Yeah, that's, that's fair. But we right? didn't sell very many. I mean, we sold maybe one $20 million drag line, like every six months if we were lucky yeah uh, yeah i mean it's it's a different scale sure um different scale of 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 numbers and of of iterations like copies of the product right yeah um but the the you mean versions when you say iterations right because copy is it's like iteration one or you mean like like i guess every time you i'm talking like yeah, you build 10,000 of the same thing. Okay, so right? 10,000 iterations. I've got it. Okay, I just want to make sure I was tracking your definition there. Yeah, I mean, iteration, I would I would consider iteration to be like version two of the product. Not That's what I thought you like meant initially. It was a the second that comes off the line, right? So you mean the second that comes off the line? Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. We'll call those copies. Got it. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> what I've seen so far is that companies really want to save product development dollars and they want to also minimize the risk that they take on during product development. So depending on what stage a product development company is at in their development cycle, they're more or less tolerant to taking engineering risks. So really early, in a project or a product's life cycle, really early in a company's yeah. life cycle, they are much more willing to take on engineering risk to do something novel and really become a market leader. Because that could give or, them the biggest competitive advantage if they hit it early on and they're able to chase that all the way down to the end. Right. Okay. Then you hit a valley in between where companies are mature enough that they've got a product or two out the door and they, they really are just hungry for more money. And so they want to make more products and they want to do so as cheaply and quickly as possible, which means taking on as little risk as possible, changing as little as possible. Because they don't want to break iteration to iteration, machine, but they also want to be able to expand. Okay, yes. They got to keep updating to suit consumer demand. Um, but Or to at least play yeah. off their previous success and, and maybe introduce some consumers, some they didn't know they needed, but they would like. Right. Add a, add a shiny feature that's essentially free to implement. Yeah. Like change sense. the color of something <laughs> or like, you know, it, 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 it gets to a point where your latitude to take big steps and big risks is just completely capped at the knees because your product development company wants to iterate quickly, release a thing quickly with as little effort and money spent as possible so that they can make as much money as possible. Yeah. Now, at a certain point, companies reach a point where they have enough money. I'm thinking specifically of companies like Apple, but, you know. Sure, yeah. Like, companies can be successful and have enough profit and money that they have the ability to invest again Ooh. in a super high risk, expensive development process to do something that no one's ever done before. Yeah. Right. You, you kind of start there and you end there, That's interesting. but in the middle, there's you can't this, afford this to be doing insane R and D risks. Yeah. yeah. That right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, you know, the company that I'm, I'm currently with feels like it's, it's on its way down this, this Valley. Um, and, Perhaps after our like two product out launches, uh, we'll start taking on more design risk. Um, 
but it, it's a design environment where really you want to emulate as much as you can. You want to make sure that someone else has done it first because that essentially validates and proves it out uh, before you agree to do it. And very little gets, you know, invented from the ground up. That makes a lot of sense. And we've worked with a lot of clients like that where they've got a product that works, but they want to change some small feature to be able to hit another market segment or they want to change mm -hmm. a color, like you said. I mean, that we've experienced that before where you know, we've had these discussions where people are considering, you know, where do we want to spend our R&D dollars? Uh, well, what if we just change a color instead? Well, if that's what works for you and your budget right now, that's what you should do. You know, that's it's totally your choice. Yep. And so, um, no, it makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting to think about. So yeah. The other thing that is very different is that product teams need a lot of buy-in from a lot of people to push a product out the door. Yeah. In machine design, all that matters is that you deliver a working machine. Yep. So you need very little input from... So really, working is defined anybody. by the specification you agree to with your client at the onset of the project, right? And so you It gotta, is a you very well-defined product or yep. problem. Yeah, exactly. That's that's been my experience as well, and so yeah, that's way different than like how do we satisfy the market, you know? And like, I mean, oh no, wait! It turns out we thought they wanted this; they really want that. And right, we, I've product development with, is inherently a guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've worked with dozens of product companies where they think they want something at the onset of, of an engagement, and then it turns on later down the line, like it has nothing even to do with you as an engineer or as a product manager. But, you know, it turns out that, you know, their customers want something else, or at least they perceive that to be the case. And so mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, stop doing what you're doing. That project's not important anymore. You got to build this thing instead. You're like, all right, well, if that's if that's what people want, you know, happy to do it. But, you know, it is. Believe kinda... it or not, like you see some insane approaches to this in product development. What do so you I have a story from my automation days, right? We built a $4 million piece of equipment for a customer. Sure. This had a ton of servo axes on it. It, it had automated part handling. It had a, a um, <clears throat> like an intelligent uh, pallet system going around. It was not just a dumb conveyor line. Like every pallet kind of had controllability. So you it, had it like really pallets intense. that were... Were the pallets custom or were they off the shelf that, that fell on? Custom. Them? Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. It, almost every pallet is custom in, in this industry. Wow. Uh, in, in machine design. But so, pallet, that, by the way, just I think I know what it is, but I'm going to ask just to get an explanation because I haven't actually been yep. a machine designer. So, is, it's just a thing that your product sits on that's, that's meant to handle it, that it moves it through yes. the machine? Okay, cool. Yep, exactly. So, a lot of equipment will maybe start with a just bare conveyor. And you'll have some material handling that picks product up, places it onto a pallet in a very specific orientation location, very accurately and repeatedly. Yeah. Every pallet's the same. It's high precision stuff so that when it goes into the machine. You have on pallets so that you can kind of yeah. think that, okay, cool. That makes sense. Yep. So stuff tends to be very well located on a pallet nice. uh, so that when it goes in for processing, the, the process is accurate. If you have a thing that goes up and down, it's going to hit the product in exactly the same place every time on every pallet. That right? makes a lot of sense. And then you've got inspection between stations probably. So if for some reason something doesn't seat right, you can, you can reject it. Right. That's, that's something that I learned uh, in machine design is every single thing that you do has to be verified after you do it. Nice. Otherwise it's like open loop and you can't, you're going to crash the machine if something goes wrong. Yeah. And right? when you do that, you, it's just a cascading failure where now you've got a pile of stuff collecting and you're never. Yeah. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. And in this kind of, in this kind of world, like every minute that the machine is down is a minute that it's not making product is a minute that it's costing your customer money. So yeah, it, it's very important. Does to, the machine to self verify. correct a lot of the time or is it, is it usually um, like you require operator intervention to take care of something like that? It really depends on the level of automation that the customer is requesting. 
That makes sense. And then but more I've, costs. I've done it more. both ways. Yeah. Yep. And so I, I built a machine. Degrees of self-correction. After, I'm after you. Sorry, I don't want to cut that story. Right. No, there there are. So I, I built a machine that self calibrates itself rather than have somebody come in. So you have a calibrated sensor and you have a thing that does a thing. And sometimes that thing needs to be calibrated. So instead <laughs> of having someone come in to calibrate it, it goes over to the calibrated sensor, engages with it, spits out a report, and then goes back to doing its thing. It can self-adjust. Awesome. That's really cool. Right? Um, you see some stuff like that where you know you build in the automation if it's scoped into the project. Yeah. If it's not, then you just kind of say, we can do this if you give us more money <laughs> and time, or like you don't get it because yeah. it's not part of the scope. And then the customer just makes a decision, like, is it going to be more economical to self-calibrate than to hire somebody to come in and do it? And that's the Right. People are expensive, and that's yeah. the whole point of automation. But in any case, so th this conversation started because we built this $4 million machine for a customer. Little did we know that there was another machine design company also building an automated piece of equipment of a similar scale for the same, for the same company for a different product. They were advancing two product lines to the point of manufacturing equipment completion before choosing one of them to move forward with. Oh my gosh. They canceled the line that we built, but like Did you get that was just like, yeah, that works out really well for a machine design company <laughs> when your uh, customer has you build the whole thing and then they don't run it. So they had like an because $8 million you don't have to maintain or it. something like that. And then they were just like, yeah. that's how much we have. And that's insane. Yeah, exactly. So as a machine designer, you're off the hook at that point and you've cashed out. Like that is the best case scenario. <laughs> what determined the decision as to which line and product to go with? Any idea? I, I couldn't tell you. I have no insight into that. I don't even know what the competing product was. It was like two teams competing internally, I guess. Wow. But yeah, like when you are so a the product development was the company tip of the that has iceberg. money. Yeah. That makes sense. That's insane to me. But yeah, you know. it's a big scale for us too and for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess I've seen like, some oh, well. things that, yeah, or, that have been worked on where, you know, you're, you're attached and you spend a lot of time, but. I don't, I don't, I don't fall in love anymore. Like I don't feel bad if, if a project I'm working on gets canceled through no fault of my own, you know, and yeah, it's just, you, you can't. Yeah. Cause I mean, you know, there's, there's another one coming around the corner and there always will be, you know, if you're good at your job. So, yep. You know. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of engineering work is that it's always in demand. Yeah. Right. We're always going to, as long as we exist in a world of things, we're always going to need stuff to make the things and we're going to need the things to be designed. So, yeah, I, I, I have no regrets about choosing this as a career path. <laughs> Same, actually. When I, was, um, when I was going to university, I remember I was at University of Pittsburgh, and um, I wanted to double major in computer science and business. And somebody was really trying to convince me to do information science instead, which was because they're like, well, that's like the same thing. That's business. And, computer. and it was really just a, like a Mickey Mouse version of neither one, you know, where the, I don't think those mm -hmm. skills would have been useful. Um, you're a, you're a database monkey, essentially. Like you're, you're basically yeah. just, you know, manipulating values and, you know, large human resources databases. It's not at all, it's soul crushing work. I'm really glad I didn't go down that path and I was never really tempted by it. But yeah. just the fact that somebody thought that was the same thing was like offensive to me, right? I'm like, no, no, it isn't. <laughs> but People without the inside knowledge of nuanced differences between stuff jump to that kind of conclusion all over the place yeah like, i get to that give me another know, example me mechanical engineering is a very broad field true as a as a mechanical engineer you can take courses in thermodynamics and fluid dynamics and stress of materials and you know dynamics of moving systems a and you can go into designing cars or engines or you know that sort of thing. And even or within can, cars, it could be a body panel, it could be an engine component, it could be a sensor right. housing. You can spend your time analyzing airflow over airplane wings. You can like be a, a fluid analysis kind of person. Like the jobs within mechanical engineering are so diverse. Yeah. Well, and to make one product sometimes, I mean, if you're at a high enough level, it takes like all those people, right? If you're if you're doing a complex mechatronic system. 
which is why I love these kind of projects so much is you get to meet so many interesting and intelligent people coming from different areas and sort of, yeah, I mean, having the diversity on your team is really important. Yeah, I agree. Well, at least it is in mechatronics. I don't know if it always is. Well, I guess it is. If you have to scale up a line, cause you still need mechatronics to do that. Yeah. I'm going to give you another example. Uh, so I work right now at a product development company and we essentially build a water system. Sure. Um, and so I'm on the design side of it, designing parts and designing the machine. We have a, a, a another mechanical engineer who used to be a college professor. Uh, he is a fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics, just guru. Probably really good for and, a water systems company, I would imagine. Yeah. Nice. And the work that he does is so, so different than the work that I do. But you need both to make the you know to make the team work. Yeah. Right? Well, just earlier today, um, and I was talking to a client about a job, and they needed a part injection molded. And we've got some brilliant mechanical engineers on the team that are super good at building robot drivetrains and all kinds of mechanisms and you know like things that can work on like electrical power lines and stuff and and not get the operator electrocuted, you know, and right. just crazy stuff. Um, but know nothing about building injection molded parts, right? Because that's its own world. I mean, you need to know about like stuff I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in that. It is. But, you know, I mean, I'm like, at a high level, you know, like draft angles and like ejection pin placement and like wall thicknesses. Yeah. Like, My and, boss is a plastics expert. Nice. And you can send him, you know, a draft of a, of a plastic part that you think you've done a good job at to injection mold. And he'll come back and say, well, actually... Let's change thirty percent of these little tiny <laughs> details to make it better for injection molding. Nice. I mean, like that. The power of expertise is huge. Yeah. So you know, it, it's mechanical engineering is a is a discipline that really lends itself well to developing expertise in a very narrow area if you are so inclined, right? Yeah. Um. But, you know, the flip side of that is that it leads to people trying to be helpful who don't really know mechanical engineering saying, hey, look at these three mechanical engineering positions that I saw. Do you want to apply to them? And one of them's <laughs> like, LinkedIn. right, one of them's like thermal analysis of rocket systems. One of them's like designing industrial equipment. And one of them's like, you know, plastics expert for ballpoint pen production or something like they're just the skills are completely different. The amount I get contacted for um, like just weird positions that have nothing to do with my skill set by recruiters on LinkedIn is, is pretty hilarious. So I mean, I'm a robotic yeah. systems engineer and mechatronic systems engineer slash like program manager. So I'm really good at mm -hmm. understanding those kind of things at a high level, like diagramming out what the, what needs to be done to make it work. So the requirements and, um, getting the right people involved and motivating them to, to see a job through to fruition. And that's, that's really my, my thing for like robots and, and machines with lots of moving parts and right. kind of things of that nature. And, and then some consumer products. So like, you know, but that's, that's, that's really where I live, but I'll get contacted. Like, you know, we've got, <laughs> we need somebody that can work on tractors like all day long. You, you want to be a tractor mechanic? <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> Not really what I do, you know, or we need somebody that can program robots all day long. And like, well, I could learn to do that, but it's not really what I do, you know, and like yeah. we need somebody that can, you know, like it's, it's, it's never. I mean, the good news right is, is that there's a ton of jobs doing a ton of different stuff. For so sure. You know, the pie is the big enough for everyone, right? Figure out what you like. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's, it's so fun when you meet somebody else that's like specialized in the same way as you, because it's so rare, you know, when you get, I think as far into your career as like you or I am. And, uh, I, I know like I, I dated somebody one time that was like, had like the same as me in that regard. And it was amazing. I was so happy. I met another, you know, robotic systems engineer that, you know, was like, doing <laughs> similar stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was, I have heard like one piece of advice that my parents gave me was don't get into romantic relationships with someone who does the exact same thing that you do. <laughs> it didn't work out, by the way. So your parents made it. Right. We got through three I, days. I don't want to laugh at that, but... Yeah, no, no, you oh, can't. Oh, gosh. Right. It's funny. 
And like, yeah, like if you're not it's... laughing, you're crying. Like, why do that? You know? <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it can be, it can be hard to find that needle in a haystack that, you know, does the exact same thing that you do. What if there's a novelty to it, but I, I think you're right, right about like, you know, like, in a, like a friendship or a relationship romantically or whatever. Like you're not going to find a lasting bond because you don't have as much to teach each other as if you had, or like, you know, I don't, you don't bring as much contrast oh, yeah. to the table. It's like opposites attract. I, I agree with that completely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think I said I spent four years in industrial automation, almost five. Um, yeah. Basically being a sponge, um, learning as much as I could from, uh, engineers towards the tail end of their careers, uh, who really just were a wealth of, of knowledge. And I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. It was, it was kind of the best so far, really the best job I've ever had. Um, and we did some really cool stuff. Like I've always been fascinated with, with things that move, yeah. right? Robots and, and mechatronic systems. And this was a really great opportunity to put some of those into, you know, to, to realize some of those ideas yeah. uh, and, and go out on a few limbs and, and try and be clever and creative. It was a lot of fun in, in mechanical design space to design this kind of equipment. Cool. Um, but I learned a lot, you know, about what it takes to make equipment that makes stuff. Yeah. Right. It's got to do the same thing millions of cycles over and over again. So the thing is the process is what I'm getting from this. Right. I okay. mean, it can be, it can be anything. So a, a, a piece of equipment can start from a, say an unstructured bin or, or product in trays and in some kind of structured way and get fed through a machine through various steps, whether it's like, you know, a, a heat staking operation or an ultrasonic welding operation or a pressure testing operation or like a just click two parts together kind of thing or screw them together or whatever. Can you talk about that thing with the rope? And then fit out the other though? side. The thing with the rope. That the threaded the mm. rope into the thing? Um, well, there is that. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So there was one project that I worked on that involved yarn. Um, it was a tiny, tiny bobbin of yarn that we wound into loops yeah. through a part that had some holes in it. So you, it was a solid part. We wound the yarn through the through two of the holes in this part. Yeah. That's what you're talking about, right? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That thing yeah. blew okay. my mind. I, I could not comprehend it. <laughs> I would go in and I just, how does this work? And, and it was the first, I think, mechanical mechanism I ever really stared at for like a good 10 minutes and still didn't understand it at the end of looking at it. It was cool. So, like yeah, it was, really it was cool. <laughs> this, this kind of engineering, it really was exciting and, and kind of got me out of bed in the morning. Um, so this, this particular project and everything that I'm talking about is on a tiny, tiny scale. So, I say the word bobbin, right? And we wound, I don't know, I don't remember how long it was anymore, but it was it was something like 12 feet of yarn onto a bobbin. A bobbin being the thing was, that holds the yarn. Yep. Okay, got it. Like so a, just, a sewing machines take bobbins, right? Not um, a, I'm just not a, a soft a, goods guy, so I appreciate the clarification. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, the bobbin was something like six millimeters in diameter by eight millimeters long. Like really, really, really small. Wow. And um, it's like the size of your finger, but like the tip of your finger. Yeah, <laughs> actually, hold on a sec. Uh, I don't know how much of this I can show you, but um, I am holding the proprietary device in my hand because <laughs> I, was, I was gifted one at the conclusion of the product. Nice. Or the project. But this, this is the bobbin inside of its sheath. So there's yeah. four parts in my hand. There's a bobbin that splits in half, and there's a, a kind of a guiding sheath to, to you know, lay out the yarn yeah. coming off the bobbin, unspooling. Um, 
So this this is very, very small scale stuff. It's, it's super high precision. And what we did was, like I said, we wound yarn up onto a bobbin and then we fed it through the, the piece with the holes. Yep. Bonded it to itself. Very cool. Moved it over to another Did you station bond with on the heat machine. Or what was the what was the way you bought? Okay. Yep. Cool. So we used an impulse heater. Um, impulse heaters are are magical tools in terms <laughs> of stealing thermoplastics against each other or against themselves. If you have a block of metal and you keep it hot, right above the melting point of a plastic, and you want to press it against something to melt it onto something else. Yeah. It's very difficult to do so with just a hot block because the thing's going to melt all over the block too. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. Um, you can kind of counteract that with like Teflon, like PTFE sheets, yep. essentially. Um, PTFE has a, a very high melting point yeah. relative to other plastics. And you can, you can get away with that. Uh, they make essentially fabric yep. from it, so flexible sheets. That's what most, like, if you buy a $100 bag sealer, uh, it has a couple cut sheets of PTFE fabric in there. That makes sense. But in any case, you know, you want to not goop up your system. Yep. So an impulse heater starts cold, touches, holds pressure, gets very hot very quickly and then cools off very quickly and then pulls away an impulse yeah that's awesome yeah so it's a resistant how quickly? essentially a resistant band uh we can probably do a five second cycle to get up to melting point of plastic nice you know that's from cold back to three cold, to five hundred right? fahrenheit -ish. yeah yeah i mean 300 500 is a little high but 300 depends on the plastic. absolutely right yeah, so PTFE would oh. start to get goopy at 500. Too shy. Right? <laughs> um, so. But no, your your range is absolutely right. Like it's yeah. it's it's in that upper, you know, the the three to five range is where a lot of thermoplastics start to to get really melty and bond. Um, so we we bonded this this particular yarn was oh man, it's been so long. I'm not sure I remember. Um, it was it was a thermoplastic yarn. So yeah, it was it's not extruded. important to know which one. Right. Uh, it was very, very, very fine. High strand count, but minuscule strands. Yeah. Uh, it was really, really tough to work with because, like, my... I don't know if you can see it, but my fingers have, like... I, I have very right rough... Oh, I'm sorry. Hard I have very rough that. hands. <laughs> Um, I, I work a lot with them in, in, in machine shop environments and I, you know, play got my, string uh, my battle scars too. <laughs> I know. I got to ask you about your finger at some point. I don't know what happened to it. We can get into that if you want. Yeah. It's just basic. Nothing too fancy. Uh, got, you, got as long as fight. you still have it, right? Uh, yeah, you, I still have it. It's all there. I, I was just cooking the other night and I, I had a dull knife and I was cutting something kind of stiff. So it was, uh, it was charcuterie I was prepping and the, <laughs> uh, the dry salami rolled. And like Tony Soprano on a bad day, it slipped and hit my finger and uh, got oh, about a five no. millimeter deep laceration. So. Oh no! It's all right. I um I had a doctor look at it. It's fine. Um, I actually dressed it myself. I was kind of proud of this. So when the knife went in, I I was unfazed because I I too work a lot with my hands, and when you work with your hands, you get cut, and that just is going to happen. There's no getting around it. It happens. It's, it's just yep. a, it's a numbers game, right? So if you're working with knives, like I, I cook a lot. I work in shops a decent amount and you know, I, I like to work at a fast pace. And when you do that, you know, you, you sometimes you get a great scraper, a bruise or a cut. And so I didn't panic. Um, there's that moment when the knife goes in where you know, you're cut, but you're not bleeding profusely yet. Um, and it doesn't hurt yet, but you see it. And so you realize that you've got to take action. And so, there's a few routes I could have gone. I could have attempted to put a butterfly closure on it and, um, you know, close the wound together. Uh, I could have tried to glue it in some way, but that might not have been great because cyanoacrylide, if it's in super glue, is not good to get into your bloodstream. It works well on wounds that have already healed to get them to close up. Right. It actually, right. Was, as you know, developed for surgical applications first and then spot on the super glue. 
And I actually know a few surgeons that swear by the Loctite super glue as like a wound stuff, you know, just to use it at home for themselves. <laughs> oh, it's great. It'll seal your skin yeah. right up. My right. dad, yeah, you that, be... that I mentioned, he, he's all about the Loctite branded super glue for sealing your skin <laughs> up for small, small guts. But this yep. was a little too big for that. And so I decided that my, my primary goal was to keep pressure on it and to stop the bleeding. And so, and the pressure helps with stopping the bleeding and also keeping the skin together. So you don't have like a dead flap of skin and, and your recovery is quicker. And so what I did is I, um, first I, uh, I just tried to kind of clean up the blood. So I went over a sink in the bathroom. I grabbed as many medical <laughs> We're supplies. We're getting graphic here. Carry, All right. Cause I had my, my first aid kit between the bathroom and my kitchen. And so I grabbed a handful of band-aids. I grabbed some prescription grade antibiotic, uh, topical, and I grabbed, um, I think one of these, uh, you know, stretchable gauzes. And, uh, the first thing I did is I cleaned it out. I, 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 I washed it. I, I rinsed out the wound. Um, I applied mupirocin, which is a prescription topical antibiotic. And then I just wrapped it in band-aids and just tried to stifle the bleeding. And it became very clear that this was, it, it was, it was leaking like a sieve at that point. And so oh, no. it was just getting it on before the blood gave you nothing you could get the adhesive onto. And so I got that on. And then um, <laughs> after that, it was still kind of dripping from the. I'm going to apologize for you to anybody listening through this, expecting machine <laughs> stories. <laughs> Touche. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't expecting it. But, you, know, you, asked, you asked that question. I mean, I did. I, I did. Give an honest yeah. answer, right? And so, and this is, I mean, this happens when you're working on machines, is the reality of the situation. Is, oh my God. Even though I was cooking, yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've had. I don't, I've been lucky enough not to have any catastrophic shop injuries, uh, knock on wood. But, uh, I mean, it happens, right? And so you want to be prepared at least and, and not panic and, and just, you know, take care of the situation. And actually, I remember after I got the wound Safety procedures. Exactly. And I always have a first aid kit nearby and I always keep it well yeah. stocked. And whenever I, I'm low on a material, like I was low on peroxide and rubbing alcohol. And so I ordered more rubbing alcohol and peroxide before going to sleep after closing the wound. And I also sharpened the knife so that it wouldn't roll again and cause the similar injury in the future. <laughs> and, and then I went to sleep. And then when I woke up, um, the wound was still a little bit open. So then I applied butterfly closures, cinched it shut, nice. cleaned it up, um, and um, you know, showered with a little thing over my hand. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually healing condoms. really nicely. Yeah, a little finger condom. And then it's healing really yeah. nicely. Um, I thought there was nerve damage. It's already repaired. I actually addressed it. I'm you know, I feel, I feel kind of proud of myself because it's, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Like this will be healed in like <laughs> five days. So yeah. That's, well, that's be careful in the kitchen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. At, at home kids, uh, don't, don't mess around with big knives unless you, uh, you know what you're doing and you know a thing or two about first aid. So. Most, most people who have done machine design for a long time can tell you some horror stories that they've oh, I got heard ones. or been privy to, uh, because industrial equipment, like most that you'll see has guarding. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It has guarding all around it. So you can't, it, tons of regulations behind it too. So you cannot get a body part into a mechanism while the thing is running. Yeah. Well, isn't that like IP, like starting with four is like blockage of just fingers, right? Like for that reason. I yeah. Think. I mean, that, that's more for products. This is yeah. like, uh, I don't, Touché. I couldn't tell you the actual regu regulation. I, I mean, like OSHA the, like the light curtains you buy where like it can detect like certain levels of, okay, I see what you're saying. Right. So you either need to tie down right. two hands, so like two hand starts, a very common thing so that you need to block two optical sensors essentially with fingers to make sure that like your two hands are not in the machine. That could be defeated by something. another person, but it would at least be harder to do. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, that's not a foolproof method. Light curtains are also not foolproof. You can, you can defeat them in various ways, but light curtains are designed to keep, you out of a mechanism pressure mats not um, really great for lighter or smaller people not designed pressure to mats or dead kids. man switches right yeah. um but really the most common thing you do is just build a polycarbonate and aluminum extrusion frame around <laughs> your machine so that nothing can get in and every door that's an access door interlock. has an interlock on it yeah right we at my last company, like at my machine design company, we preferred to use locking interlocks that locked the doors shut while the machine was running. Smart. And you had to either e-stop or manually release them to open it. 
Which means that the machine um, has time for the inertia of the moving parts to slow right. down. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, all kinds of safety concerns with industrial automated equipment. Yeah. You don't want to get your hand smashed by a, a, an also, actuator that has several hundred pounds of actuation force. I got a story about a, a boss I actually had at a certain company I worked for. Uh, you've probably heard this oh, one. No. <laughs> the guy was a captain of the Marines. He was he was still a reservist. Um, he was he was a tremendous uh, jerk. We'll say uh, he yelled a lot. So my, my first day on the job at this company, I mean, you know me, I've got kind of a sense of humor. I, I like to I, I get things done, but I like to kind of enjoy myself while I'm doing them. And, and so you know that, that's when I work the most efficiently is when I'm kind of cracking a joke or smiling, but being, you know, still results driven. And mm-hmm. so. My predecessor, uh, who had just accepted a job at Tesla, was training me uh, to take over his position, and I um, was absorbing information as quickly as I could in the two days he had to train me. And in doing so, I mean, both of us had similar sense of humor. We were cracking jokes and, you know, making all sorts of innuendos. And, and I mean, yeah, we were, we were actually making a pretty good clip at, at the rate at which we were transferring information. I mean, we were, we were getting through it fast because we were doing it in a way that was pleasant for both of us. But the guy comes over, he's like, ah, what are you guys laughing about? Stop that. Ah, you know, so it was never really a great relationship with that particular boss. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, about three or four days into my job there, I noticed he came into work uh, the next day with uh, a bandage over his thumb, and it seemed very short. Well, it turns oh, out this guy no. had amputated the tip of his thumb uh, by, he was using a chop saw, and he clamped a piece, he clamped his thumb between extrusion and the backstop, and then he... Brought down no! the carbide tip plate. <laughs> oh god! Pinched it off, no. and so for weeks, months, the, <laughs> honestly, the entire duration of the contract I had with this company, um, we were not allowed to use scissors without wearing cut-proof gloves because occupational health and safety had was terrified because of what this guy had done, and so it, it was just it was it was a case of of just neglect or just lack of sleep or i don't know what exactly caused the uh, that's the issue terrifying. but this guy this guy was was not fully alert um he lost his thumb or at least part of it and then all of us had to use tools inefficiently as a result of that misstep and so that was there was another time at the same place where um somebody had over tightened a bolt and um the uh the bolt necked which is uh, for our listeners when a bolt stretches out and um, a lot of times what will happen if it's not hardened is it just the threads don't really work anymore. But if it's a hardened bolt, uh, its propensity to crack goes up. It gets more brittle. And so this was one of those. And um, the bolt tip shot off like a bullet and embedded in a concrete wall. So you can imagine what would have happened if a person had been in the way of that. You know, they, they, wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't be alive anymore. And so, I mean, that kind of stuff is... I mean, I, you've heard your stories, too, about like you know guys that are going to... Mis- uh, facilities with presses that don't have modern safety interlocks like you were talking about on them. Yeah, right. And I mean, I heard a story one time about a facility where uh, one of my colleagues went in to, to do some maintenance on some machine tools and um, every worker seemed to be missing digits or, or something, you know, like they, like they were like, a, like an arm gone or like a couple of fingers here, you know, and, and when he saw these, the state of these tools, he knew why. I mean, there's there no safety systems in place and, and it was, I mean, it was honestly unfortunate that, that that was allowed to continue. So, We had a machine shop at my first company. I think this is uh, the last story, and then I'll, I'll steer us back towards my, my yarn process. Sure but, thing, yeah, yeah. This is kind of meant um, to be uh, freeform, so this is good. Yeah, if we can, you know, I I don't want to draw, like, forget about anything we touch on here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at my first job, we had a fully staffed machine shop. Several of the guys in there, I think two or three, were missing fingers. Holy, holy heck. None of the accidents involved machine tools. Wait, what? Car crashes, uh, crazy happenstances, like none of the Dabbling stories. <laughs> right? Yeah. So you see a guy working in a machine shop, missing fingers, and you go, oh, he probably... Screwed Sansa. up one yeah, day, right? something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, nope. <laughs> these guys were missing fingers <laughs> due to circumstances completely unrelated to working in a machine shop. Jeez, it's yeah. just a coincidence. Like it was just a pirate crew. Oh my gosh! Yeah. 
No, that's crazy. Well, they were good guys. No, no. I mean, you know, a lot of times guys like that are like, I mean, when you meet somebody <laughs> that's been through something horrific, like, I, I feel like that's a person that's never going to complain because there's a long line at the Starbucks. You know, I mean, it, it gives people a sense of perspective, um, at least in my limited experience. You know? Yeah, uh, no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that for sure. All right. So back to your yarn story. Right. Back to yarn. Yeah. Um, this very, very fine thread filament yarn is pain in the ass to work with because I have rough hands and that's how we got off on this tangent here. Sure. There's a good one. Um, I like that tangent. But it also means that like every surface that comes into contact with it needs to have a very, very fine surface finish. So a lot of times when you're just making parts and making stuff, you don't worry too, too much about surface finish. And if you have a standard drawing template that you work from, it has a standard surface finish call out of like a 1.6 or something. And like, you don't worry too much about it until you have to. So this was a really good lesson in when you have to worry about surface finish, because I had to polish the crap out of all of this stuff. <laughs> to make it work um but I, I i've only described about half of what we did right so we we wound yarn onto a bobbin we yeah uh, we bonded it to itself with impulse heat and then we moved this fragile little single ply loop over to another station and interfaced with two spindles servo controlled yeah that <sighs> Spun it up, spun the whole loop. But they knew how many started... times they had spun around into like how many degrees at the end because they're yes. servo control. That's so cool. Yep. Servos are, are awesome. Yeah. And I mean, I've um, worked with servos with similar accuracy, but just to hear something like that where it's like, Zzz! I know exactly where I am. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it spun 30 loops through this tiny part, through the holes in this tiny part. And, uh, you know, it, it really was, it was a cool mechanism. It was nice. fun to design. That's awesome. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, just to, just to see a glimpse of that, um, I mean, that, that was one of the things, that was one of the most impressive pieces of mechanical engineering I think I've ever seen in my career. I mean, it, just, it was beautiful. It was <laughs> I mean, geometrically, like it, it was, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't a massive scale, but just the intricacy at, at that scale there. I mean, I don't know. I, I just, you have to give credit where credit's due. Like that was, that was a really fine sure. piece of engineering. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it was fun. I, I wish I, Honestly, like I, I do want to go back to that style of engineering at some point. I don't think product development is really for me. That's fair. You know, it's it's way more. It's like simultaneously way more constrained, but also way more ambiguous. Like it, it's kind of this weird well, it's cost constrained, right? But then the yeah the dimensions it's cost constrained it's input constrained like everybody needs buy in it like you you don't have any latitude to to when make your own decisions okay um but at the same time like at the very beginning of the process at least no one really knows what anybody's doing we're all just kind of circling around aiming you know trying to figure out where to aim yeah that makes sense um, well and that's what we've experienced or what I've experienced I should say with. Uh, the clients I work with at the company I'm at right now in terms of um, like mainly startups and just companies that are looking to have product designed is they don't really know what they need. They're like, well, we want it to go fast. Well, how fast, you know, you want it to go 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour. You know, well, yeah. we don't know. Oh, well, how about this? All right. That sounds yeah. good. Let's go with that. You know? <laughs> so. and, and you can't like pin blame on anything in particular. Like I think this is just kind of inherent to the product development process. You know, that there is a period where you are doing a lot of work to figure out where to go. And you can't yeah. do any work to go anywhere yet because you don't know where you're going. And you can't take steps in a direction if it's the wrong direction. So, like, you, you are very, very constrained in what you can do for quite a while until, like, the direction becomes clear enough that you can take a few steps in the right direction and everybody's aligned and it is, it is in fact the right direction. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, whereas like in contrast with machine design, you can take a couple steps in a direction and if it's 
good enough, if it's a direction that will work, you can take a couple more steps and like you can move very quickly into the details and make, you know, get the mechanism working prototype quickly, proof of concept quickly. That's interesting because it feels like it moves much faster. I feel like products are, I mean, that's the mantra you mantra you hear mantra mantra. I'm not sure. But that, that's what people say you're supposed to do with like with new product development, right? Is, is you're meant to be nimble and quick and iterative and go this direction and see it through and then, you know, do another thing over here. But that's interesting. There's a lot of talk about moving quickly, but realistically, like it moves very, very slowly until like the last possible point it can, at which point all of a sudden okay, I think we know where we're going. Now go there as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> and then you make a lot of sacrifices along the way to get there. And then you get there and then you push a product out. And when you say sacrifices, um, you mean like racking up engineering debt by sort of making guesses and, and doing things kind of in a hacky way just to get something out of the door? Yeah. Okay, we've been asked to do that too. And, and so I should say I've been asked to do that too where on teams I've been leading. So I guess it is a we. Um, but you know, there was a project we took on last year where um, a client needed something um, very, very intricate. Um, I can't say what it was. It was a challenging one. Um, And it was Mm -hmm. something that they were having issues solving and um, they didn't really know what they needed. So they, they sort of knew what they needed, but you know, they, they needed a thing to test it against users to figure out how they responded to figure out what they really needed. And so, it was it was interesting. So you know, you, you sort of rush at this thing and you get it there. Like, all right, well now we put it in the hands of our client, and it turns out they don't want X, Y, and Z. And you're like, all right, well, you asked us to go at a really really fast pace. So in order to engineer out X, Y, and Z, it's it's going to take like either a totally new engineering effort, or we're going to have to really consolidate what we worked on. But it, it's going to be a little extra timeline to be able to re- back out that engineering debt and and get to that next waypoint. Like, well, we don't have that time. It's like, all right, well, that, that's going to be resources. We need to get a few more people on the team to build it out to hit that goal. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Right. To see it's, it's a very fascinating balance. Oh, like, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm getting this experience here. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, it's a fascinating balance of stall then sprint. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Right? I've seen that too a lot with, with some of our clients. So you can't take steps right away because there are so many competing variables and so many unknowns that it's very likely that any step you take is going to be in the wrong direction. Yep. Because the right direction is just so murky. Yeah, it's it's nebulous. Um, you don't have a good requirement set up. So I, I've seen it described as like we are making tiny circles where you circle from everybody in the team on these tiny little circles and the distance from you to the next person is very quick. So it's a very quick, short feedback loop. And eventually you start circling a bigger and bigger. So that's when you bring in execs and and kind of stakeholders and then the customers. No, it's where you have more distance between you and the next person to take steps and design something and and put detail in. Interesting. So how does Um, that, how does that actually manifest in your experience when you say more distance? Like, is that physical distance? Is is their schedules busy? You guys are thinking like different things. It's mostly like a time scale, say. Uh, So for example, if, you know, at the very beginning of the project, you can kind of do a complete 180 in the course of two or three days. Yeah. But at some point, you're going to stop doing 180s in two or three days, and you're going to have like a clearer direction. And if you're given a week to move in that direction, you can get very far, yeah. right? And so it's it's kind of that that growing time scale of the, I guess, uncorrected or. Uh, I guess that's the best word I can come up with, the uncorrected work that you can do. Um, So at the beginning of the project, you know, you need to be in very close communication with every stakeholder and and doing this this really tight circle. And eventually, like, everyone's aligned enough that you can 
have oh, I longer see. time between your meetings, between your checkpoints. Yeah, that makes sense. And be sure that the direction that you're going is in the right path. Yeah. Um, that's been my experience as well. I just, I guess I didn't fully understand the, what the circles radius was meant to represent, but yeah, yeah it means I, understanding because you've got understanding, right. you've got trust and, and you're aligned. Now you can increase the time between meetings, which means your meeting overhead, the time to prepare for meetings goes down, which means you can be more productive. And so that, that all makes sense. Yep. Cool. Yep. Very, very interesting. I agree. And it's, it's one of those things stuff. where it's hard to understand if you're not in the trenches doing it. But my real, my hope here is we can sort of help people get like a little bit of a, of a feeling of what it's like just by having these discussions. And so, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very, like I said, I'm really glad I'm getting this experience. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to ride this out till we, till we launch a product. Yeah. Like it'd be really cool to see something that you worked on hit the, in the field. Thousands of it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like that's I a cool feeling. That. Yeah, exactly. Right. How close are you to like the, the actual product that's going to be like stocked on shelves or, or sold in stores or I don't know what your market is and I don't need to, but I mean, how close are you to actually seeing that, you know, sort of hit the markets as you will, if you will. Within six months, I think there will be, you know, cool. Something that I've worked on will be fielded. And, and it'll be stuff that you worked on directly as opposed to you built tools to make the thing. Right. Okay, cool. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing where there's very little tools to make the thing. Um, we have tooling for sheet metal. We have tooling for plastics. Uh, but the sheet metal shops and the injection molding houses are the ones that made those tools, right? Yeah. Um, so it's it's not automated at all. It's, it's low volume enough that we have contract manufacturers and line operators and it's put together yeah. by hand. That's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that's always a good first step, right? I mean, you, you don't, I mean, I guess unless you're like an insanely large company and you've already, you know, you've got the resources to go right to, you know, that $4 million line or, or more, you know, um, I mean, I don't know, you probably want to test it on a smaller scale and see how it does. And then, you know, invest in that tooling to, to make it quicker yep. if you need to. No, we're still a pretty, pretty small company, still in startup mode. Just, I know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs>